Okay, I'll tell you. We are live. Hi, Yay. everyone, on uh, Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. Hey, hey. <laughs> oh, this is so embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> Hi everyone, welcome to our conversation uh, about Corridors of Death, the struggle to exist in historical white institutions by Malaika Wa Azania. Uh, and we will essentially be talking about this book today. And you're yeah. welcome because it's really fantastic. You're welcome to post if you wanna say hello, if you want to do something, you're welcome to post all, all your hellos, all your greetings. We will be able to share them. And also, from wherever you're joining us, if you want to ask questions, you're welcome to. We'll leave some time at the end to ask questions. I think we also need to uh, commend Malaika, you know, between traveling and transitioning and working, uh, they, they thought they would make it at a particular place and they couldn't, but now they're with us even from their car. So shout out to Malaika for just like being like, I'm gonna make this happen at all costs. Yeah. <laughs> I feel bad, guys. I'm, I feel very bad, and I'm very sorry about that. Um, yeah, I would have, I would have preferred to be at home, but um, I think that what matters is the substance of what we're going to discuss, not necessarily the geography. But uh, I'm very sorry, nonetheless, and I'm very thankful to be here. Thank you for putting up with me. Yes, welcome. Uh, we have the, the pleasure of having uh, Malaika Wazani. So I'm just going to read her bio at the back. This is a very summarized bio, um, but just know that you're in the company of great news. So we have Malaika Wazania, who is a pan-Africanist feminist and award-winning essayist. She's given lectures locally and internationally on the question of race relations in the democratic dispensation about which she is passionate. A graduate of Rhodes University, Malaika is an activist deeply committed to institutional transformation. She's a television presenter, a columnist in the Sowetan and Herald newspapers, and a senior specialist in the city of Eguruleni Metropolitan newspaper. And she is the author of Corridors of Death, The Struggle to Exist in Historically White Institutions. Welcome. I think it's important. Thank you. I think it's important for us to just read, you know, um, some of the sort of blurbs that have been given about this book, just to contextualize like how important this discussion will be. So Panyasa Lisufi, who is the MEC of Education and Youth Empowerment in Gauteng Province, wrote, masterfully crafted. It is clear that Malaika wa Azania masters the art of writing good books. Another one is Buti uh, Manamela, the Deputy Minister of the Higher Education Training Transit Technology, who said, through the window of Malaika's book, this book helps us to see what monstrous of transformational challenges we are facing within changing our universities to what they truly should be, urgent, remarkable, and impeccable. And another person who is a spokesperson of the South African Union of Students and former SRC president of the University of uh, Pretoria, Tabo, who's also mentioned in the book writes, Corridors of Death amplifies the daunting lived realities of thousands of faceless students who would risk it all in a quest for free, decolonized education. And these are just some of the blurbs and some of the comments that people have made about this really important book. And we as the Cheeky Natives really have the important conversation of coming together and holding space for Malaika as we discuss this book. I think at the onset, we want to say that our conversation will be very triggering. So if at any moment you feel that you're not able to uh, participate in the conversation, we'd encourage you to step out for a little bit and come back. Uh, we're going to talk about institutional violence and also talk about suicide. So it's going to be very triggering and we're going to talk about depression and about anxieties and just existing as a black person in these institutions and some of the content that we'll be discussing will be very triggering. So if you just need to take a moment, we will understand because Alma and I were both triggered and we had to take several moments in order to come back to the book. Mm. Sure. Yeah. Mm. So Malaika, welcome to the Cheeky Natives. <laughs> How, how do you feel? Like, I suppose now that the book is out and now that people are reading the book and interacting with the book, how do you feel now that this, your second book is out and it's out of your hands now? I feel scared. Um, I feel very scared. And I think um, that is in part because 
of the nature of the book, right, of the contents of the book. The book is, as you have correctly said now, um, giving a trigger warning to the viewers that it deals with very deeply sensitive, very deeply triggering um, questions, you know, and it's a subject that is very, um, not very often, very publicly spoken about. And one of the things that I'm very scared about is the fact that when I wrote this book, I was very conscious and deliberate that I don't write anything that's going to be hurtful to people that I want to write about, right? So I don't want to be hurtful to Black people. I don't want to be hurtful to young people. But I'm constantly worried that what if somebody reads this, you know, a young person who's dealing with depression and they... I say something that's problematic in the book because you must understand that I'm not a I'm not a qualified psychologist I'm not a qualified um, you know psychiatrist or anything like that so a lot of the work some of you know uh, content of the of the or the, the the backing up of some of the arguments that I make I had to depend on literature but I know as a scholar as a student but also as an activist that literature is not is not adequate to capture the essence of people's emotions and feelings. So what might sometimes be written in the text might not necessarily reflect the realities and the actual feelings of what really makes us human, right? So I'm very scared that um, some of the things that, that I might have said might be intellectually sound, but emotionally might be very hurtful to someone to whom this book ought to be something that is not going to be hurtful. So I think fear is one of the, 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 the overriding emotions. But I also feel very excited because I do think that this book is, a, is an important intervention about a conversation that we desperately need to have as a country, right? And one of the things that I found when I was doing my research in the book is that there isn't a lot of literature about mental health issues, especially as it pertains to how they affect Black students in historically white universities. In fact, this is going to be one of the first in that in, in that subject, you know? So I think um, the excitement comes from the fact that I'm hoping that this book is going to provide a platform for young people, for practitioners of education in higher education and elsewhere to engage in this meaningful full conversation and I, I look forward to what kinds of interventions are going to come out of it, what kind of conversations are going to come out of this. Um, so yeah, I think it's fear and, and excitement and of course also um, I'm relieved that it's finally done, you know, and um, you know, I was saying to 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 someone uh, just a, on a podcast last week that this book was very difficult to write, right? Very difficult because um, just as you guys had to read it and pause all the time, even the, the the data collection process was the same way. I had to collect data and stop all the time, and and part of the reason was that you know you go to people and you ask them to open up about very deeply triggering issues, and sometimes they're not able to go on in one sitting of an interview, right? So um, you correctly said, Lisa Honolo, that the the, the, the spokesperson of Saus who wrote the blurb at the back table is spoken about in the book, right? But you will remember in the chapter where we speak about Tabo, he's speaking, he's recalling his, you know, his witnessing of suicide, right? Of, of a student who died by suicide, jumping off a, 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 a roof and all of that. And he saw that. And so something like that, we had to pause. And I, I remember when we were doing that interview with Tabo, we, we, we did the recording and then... um. You know, and it got very emotional. We were in a restaurant in Pretoria. We did the recording and it got very emotional and the recorder fell. And by the time we picked up the recorder, we realized that it had stopped recording. So I couldn't get the entire story because of that, right? But then I couldn't go back the second time around and touch on some of those other issues because of the, the kind of emotion that it had solicited out of him. So the second time that we had to have the interview, you know, it, it, we constantly had to have interviewed. There's no one person that I interviewed only once. It was constant, you know, we stop, we pause, when it gets too heavy, we have to stop and all of that. So it was a very um, emotionally taxing and psychologically hemorrhaging process. So the fact that it was comp it's now done and all of that, I'm relieved that, you know, we are past the, um, the grueling ex experience and exercise of collecting the data that is very, yeah, that is very deeply hemorrhaging. And I mean, there's something so interesting in what you've said, you know, about mental health. And I, I think that the chapter in which you spoke about the renewed conversation or the, the generational gap between how born freeze are seeing mental health and how older people may be seeing it is there's quite a big chasm, right? So, I mean, you write yeah. about somebody who's quite a progressive academic who then went on to write about um, black students' mental health as almost like a, like a, like a nice city, like a nice complaint yeah. that they were having, you know, yeah. that it was like a secondary complaint. Yeah. And I and I really want to know that you know you you made quite a strong point about how even someone who is as progressive as that was still struggling mm -hmm. to see mental health really for the burden that it can be right on on yeah. like 
And so I, I want to know what, now that you're at the end of the, you've written the book and the conversations are happening, what do you really hope will come out of that? What do you hope will will come out as a conversation, but also what will start to bridge the chasm in our understanding of, of mental health, right? Because I think that you, you really explored some very interesting ideas. So you think of like, Model C students who really seem to have it all in many ways. They are not first generation graduates, but like they say it's right. And even those people have mental health problems. And that's something that you you read, you you cover, you know. So I'm very curious so about that. It's it's it's, it's um so the, 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 you're speaking about um Professor Nomalangam Kizi, right? One of the most absolutely the most one of the most progressive um you know um academics that I know. She absolutely is one of the most progressive academics I know. Mm-hmm. You you will be hard pressed to find someone who is as thorough in you know engaging the question of race relations, um, you know, a pan Africanist at heart and all of those things, mm-hmm. right? But like I'm saying, even Nomalang, a feminist, a pan Africanist and all of that, mm-hmm. still got it wrong on this question of mental health. And that is a mm-hmm. for me. That is not a an indictment on her per se. More than it is a reflection of the extent to which society in its entirety, and especially the black community in its entirety, has not mm-hmm. really invested very much in making sense of this question, right? And what it really is and what it represents, right? Um, and I saw um that Dr. Uh, Professor Nomalangam Kiza did write, in fact, a review uh trying to explain the position that she was she was articulating in 2014, which for me, I mean, of course, we'll engage that at another time. But the point, the point is this, right? That we we come from a place where Mental health has never been a priority. It has never been. Mm-hmm. I, I, mm-hmm. I was, I was born and raised in Soweto. I grew up in Soweto in in Midlands, and then we later moved on to Dobsonville. We moved later onto an RTP settlement and so on. And we have had all kinds of con- even with my mother, by the way, my late mother, who was a progressive at heart. You you would have been hard pressed to find anyone as progressive as my mother. You know, and I I always mm-hmm. say I credit the person that I am to her. Very progressive on race politics very progressive on gender politics, very progressive on class politics, a, a brilliant and dynamic woman. But my mother has never had, we've never had an easy conversation to speak about. And I, I will give an example, a personal example. I was diagnosed with clinical depression when I was um, in high school, right? Mm-hmm. And um, my mom had a very difficult time making sense, a very difficult time, a very progressive one. She, could, she couldn't make sense of it. She didn't understand it. And she constantly kept saying, you know, you are so intelligent. You are so, you are only so happy. How is this even possible you know um and that's generally the attitude and the thinking right that you people don't expect people like emma to have any mental health problems right because we are very highly functional right highly articulate quite intelligent seemingly very successful and and all of that right and i think that's mm-hmm. what it, that's why it's so it's so pervasive amongst you know the so-called model seeds that you speak about um about alma that these kids that look like they've got it all figured out and so on but they're battling with this thing and it's actually mm-hmm. even harder for them because first of all, you have to negotiate mental health in a world and a space that does not understand it, right? But you also then also have to negotiate it in a space that says someone like you can't be depressed, someone like you can't have anxiety. And in the book, mm-hmm. I begin with the story of Kensa- of Kensani, um, who was a student at Rhodes University, right? Mm-hmm. Um, the poss- possibly what in the eyes of the world is a least likely candidate of, of depression, least likely candidate in the sense that this is a girl in a historically white university, a quite a very good institution from a very well off family. You know, she's mm-hmm. Miss Varsity Shield. So she's a very beautiful girl, Miss Varsity Shield in the country and so on and so forth. You don't expect someone like that, right, to have mm-hmm. mental health problems that are so debilitating that they would mm-hmm. even die by suicide, right? Mm-hmm. Um, we often attribute these kinds of things to particular persons not people like that and what i want to come out of this conversation really of oh, the conversation that i want to hear coming out is firstly i want young black people first and foremost to be honest and open about the kinds of mental challenges and anguish that they're dealing with right i don't mm-hmm. want young people to chase the idea of black excellence i don't want mm-hmm. young black women to chase the idea of being strong black women i want us to completely annihilate and eradicate the idea that for us to function as truly human, for us to be seen as brilliant as we are, we have to be strong, we have to be unbreakable, and we have to be important. We don't have to be. And that's what I want to say to young black people. We don't have to be strong, right? On you end. don't have to be strong. You have to, you have to, you have to be human and to be vulnerable and to be able to say, I can't take this anymore. This is too difficult and it's heavy. And to do so without being made to feel that if you do that, then you are abdicating your responsibility as a graduate in your family, as a provider in your family, as all of this, because there are so many burdens that come with being young and black 
and a first generation graduate and a you know there's so many burdens that come with that right you you are not allowed to to be truly human because you are constantly surviving and so when you are always in a state of survival you can't be human because every day you wake up and every day you go to sleep the thing that comes to your mind is how am i going to make tomorrow better for my family is my family going to eat um my work if i don't do well at work then i disappoint an entire generation of black people because as black people i can we are not judged on our own individual merit we are judged as a race so even in the mm-hmm. workplace we overextend ourselves everywhere that we are because we always live with this thing you know black excellence must show i'm doing this because i want to prove that you know as black people we are capable and and all of that so we've got mm. so many burdens that come with being black so many burdens that come with being young so many burdens that come with being the one that the family looks to as the solution to so many problems in the family that it's impossible for us to pause and breathe and say it's heavy and it's hard and i want young people to read this book and to say it is okay for it to be heavy and it is okay for it to be hard right mm-hmm. um and it's okay for you to say i am i'm falling apart and that when you do that you are not seeking attention but when you do that you are in fact demonstrating that you have had many years of resistance and that today you want to take a moment just a a pause right a pause to focus on yourself and to self preserve and that self preservation is not selfish it's an act of revolutionary warfare in a society that says to black people we don't have a right to be human and mm. and, and more than anything else alma i want this book to make people and especially the older generation right our mothers and the likes of professor malanga kizes and all of that right i want them to understand that this generation of black of young black people born into the democratic dispensation have got challenges that might not seem that they are real but the numbers indicate something the numbers of young people who are dying in institutions of higher learning the numbers of people who are dying outside of these institutions right the numbers of young black people who are drug addicts alcohol addicts and so on whom we dismiss as being you know we dismiss them for whatever reason not recognizing that these are used as numbing agents for a world that is spinning out of control that we need to have a closer look right at the links between the institutions that exist in society and how they impede on the capacity of black people to live lives of dignity and i want people who control and run these institutions who are part of these institutions to recognize that if they don't do anything meaningful and significant about creating spaces that are safe for black people to be human we are going to create a society of violence we are going to create a society of alienation and we are going to create a society in which black people are constantly going to be animalized and in the process are then going to behave animalistic hmm. i mean you've said quite a mouthful right and like there's so much to unpack there uh but yeah. M- michelle on facebook says you don't have to be a strong black woman azania i feel like you're preaching to me because i don't find it easy allowing myself to be vulnerable and uh rifula also on facebook says i needed to hear that especially today and then we've got anna who says powerful a deep breath or a pause is essential but i also think that what is really useful in reading corridors of death is finding a language right and articulating what it is that we're going through i find that and you can correct me if i'm wrong but i think that when you wrote the book in many ways you were also trying to figure out this language for yourself right yeah. so there yeah. were these events that were happening and you were like i just don't understand why these events are happening but also something that you said earlier that it particularly talking to the older generation about how a mental health or mental wellness is not something that we are trained right it's like embedded mm-hmm. in our dna as black people somewhat yeah. that we have to beg ezela we constantly have to be the people who are toiling and toiling and toiling but i think in many ways the experience at roads and all the conversation that you have throughout the book is you acquiring a language and saying we are dying here right yeah, uh, yeah. and I want this language to be a language that we are comfortable with talking about. So mental health, depression, anxiety is not a swear word. It's literally yeah. you taking a moment for yourself and saying this is too much for me and I need to find assistance if I can so that it's not too much for me. So I wanted to speak about that right. Was that like in writing the book was that also a moment for you so sort of a a journeying for you of finding a language to say oh I now understand because there's a moment in the book where you speak about the friend that you had at Rhodes who has this middle class background and you're like 
I don't understand why this person is doing this. Like you have yeah. everything that you need, right? Yeah. But you say as during research, writing the book, you're like, oh, hold up. I may have been too presumptuous about what I yeah. assume middle-class privilege gives you, but yeah. actually being in this institution and seeing people navigate this institution is hard. So one of the things that I've come to appreciate, so I've always been, I've, I've always been very invested in calling things by their name. Right? I've always been invested. I, I love language. I mean, I mean, I'm, 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 I love language and I've got this very extensive vocabulary, right? So for me, it should not have been, or look from the outside looking and you would think it shouldn't be very difficult for Malaika, who's very articulate, who's got a very extensive vocabulary to write about these kinds of things. But I, I, I found something very interesting when I was writing this book, right? Which initially I thought was a weakness, but I later realized it's actually Actually, at the core of the argument I'm making, which was that I did not have a, I did not have words to articulate a lot of things. So there were a lot of things I, I couldn't understand. I could feel them, but I couldn't put a word on them. You know, I couldn't, I couldn't say, you know, this is what racism looks like at Rose University, mm -hmm. right? I couldn't say, I couldn't give you incidents and say, oh, you know, this particular thing happened, or you know, this thing. It's the theory for this thing is this. This is how you theorize this thing intellectually. I couldn't find those words. I didn't have the language. But I realized that, that that's exactly what racism is, right? That's exactly what these things that drive black people to levels of sub subhumanry. That's exactly what they are. They are things that don't always have words. And they are things that cannot always be intellectualized, right? But they are mm. there. And the fact that you don't have the language for it does not invalidate it, right? So Amen. when I think about what, what as a, at some point, Lisa is trying to explain racism at roads and you know, and she just she doesn't have the she just cries. Lisa does not speak in that in that thing, and, and and you know she and I'm hoping she's watching this or she's going to be part of this conversation. She was at the time doing her masters. She stood up in front of the the, the hall at, at the university, the great hall at the university, to explain. You know, to speaking, having conversations about it because during the fees must fall time, we're trying to explain racism at Rhodes, and she didn't say anything. She stood there, and before she could speak, she just burst into tears and cried. And at that moment, when Lisa cried, I mean, it was silent in the hall. Everybody. People just started, you know, you could see tears out, you know, falling from people's eyes and all of that. It, it was heartbreaking the moment. But for me, I found that moment to have been, in fact, the most articulate point in my life where racism was explained. That was, for me, the most articulate expression of racism, right? Without the words, she didn't say anything. She didn't say anything. She just cried. But for me, that is an articulation that is deeper than anything else, right? Because it's it's a thing that says to us, first and foremost, it is not valid only because there is a correct uh, theory, theory to, to back it up. It's not valid only because there's a word that explains it and you can find it in a dictionary. It's also valid if it does something to my humanness that is so absolutely agonizing that the only way in which I know how to respond to it is through the most basic of human instinct, and that is to let down my tears and to cry. Now, that mm -hmm. is for me the thing that, that this book taught me, right? That you need to be able to to understand these things, we, we, we've been so invested. And I think it's also a very deeply colonial way of, of engaging issues, right? That we tend to be so focused on reason, right? That we don't think emotions are reason, right? We've been led to believe that emotions are not reason. We've been led to believe that knowledge and science is valid only when it, knowledge in particular, is only valid if it can be articulated in words. But but part of, part of growing into what it means to be a true human being, part of growing into appreciating your blackness as a person it's also understanding that part of what we are as black people is that we're also very deeply spiritual beings right very deeply spiritual that some of these things that we've been led to believe are are the valid or the, the, the essence of what makes us intellectual really aren't that much and you know shouldn't be shouldn't be seen as the sole indicators that the indicators also can be in how we express our emotions and how we 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 validate those emotions as genuine and as true and racism does that right and i think it's also because because racism that that births all of these mental pathologies right is such a an assault on your humanity it makes mm. sense therefore that in responding to it your response is also going to be very deeply human and not necessarily only intellectual because racism does not only deal with 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 demonizing your thinking as a black person racism deals fundamentally with dehumanizing your humanity it deals with dispossessing you 
of that which makes you human, right? And so when we want to reclaim a language of how we articulate this racism that births mental pathologies, we also need to therefore reclaim the very essence of our humanity, which is that of being in touch with our emotional selves, our vulnerable spiritual selves, and all of these other things that, like I say, make us truly human. I want to know what was the the most difficult parts of the book to write. So, I mean, when I was speaking to Lutlofo Nola, I had to take a break when you were speaking to Lorado from um, the Viz yes. Health Sciences. Yes. Because yes. I I was a graduate of, I am a graduate of the Viz Health Sciences. Yes, doctor, come through. <laughs> No, you know, it's a, it's a, I have a tenuous relationship with, with that faculty, but it's a different conversation. And I found it so difficult to read that portion because of what you're saying, that this was one of the first times that I saw my experiences in print, you know, so I often yeah. will say, I'll often say to my husband, oh, you know, med school was so racist. And even when I tell him the stories, now I, I'm looking back, I'm like, oh my goodness, there was so much racism that I experienced and I just didn't realize. But to see the print was so, was so, was affirming for me. But it was also very, very difficult to read because someone who graduated after me and it was to realize that fundamentally this institution has not changed, that fees must fall, roads must fall, all of these things which have happened have not changed the institution fundamentally and that was the most difficult thing for me to read. And so I want to know what you were most challenged by writing and why that particular section challenged you so much. So for me, I was challenged by a lot in the book. In fact, I think the entirety of the book challenged me a lot, but I will tell you one of the I think at the very beginning, it was even the challenge of the thought of asking people to talk to me about these things. You know, it was, I mean, it was, it was difficult. It was very difficult. And I, I put there the email, like the email exchange between me and Tanda, because I wanted people to understand the, the anxieties that even went into the, the process of wanting to write this book, right? It was very difficult for me. It was very difficult for me to go to people that I knew had gone through unimaginable pain, right? Mm -hmm. And to ask them to say, please lay your soul bare to the world, right? Um, it was difficult for me to sit with people, to sit with Tabo, um, who is a very supposedly, you know, very strong, so-called strong person, and to see him cry like that, right? To say, Malaika, mm -hmm. I saw a human being die. I saw mm -hmm. a person die. You know, I think that day that day when Tabo said to me, and I, because the time, the, 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 the recording, you know, got messed up and all of that, you could only get some snippets of it, right? But there was a, you know, I kept replaying this one part of it, that way he says, Malaika, when a person dies, they don't die immediately. Like when a person falls from 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 a, from a building, they don't die immediately, right? Yeah. Um. And he went into graphic detail explaining what he saw, and mm -hmm. for I think I paused, you know, and I, my 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 publisher Tabiso was um very frustrated with me in this book process. I'll tell you, she we fought a lot, me and her, in this process, right? And it was likely because I would vanish. I would vanish for a month. I would stop communicating for a month. I'd, literally vanish for a month right i'd vanish from speaking to her from speaking to everyone as well right i'd switch off my phones sometimes for a week sometimes for a few days sometimes for a whole month i'd be gone and 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 because i i couldn't i couldn't go on there were times when i almost just couldn't go on with this book because when you have to go through the data right and decide what obviously you want to put in what you're not going to put in Mm -hmm. And you basically relive all those conversations that you've had with people. And you remember their faces as they were telling you. Because I sat with all of these people, all of them. We sat face to face. I did not want to do telephonic interviews and so on. With the exception of one um, lady from Stellenbosch that I only spoke to much later. Uh, we spoke much later, so we could only speak on the phone. It was locked down. Not locked down. It was a uh, thing. It was quite later in the, in the, in the, in the, in the book and all of that. I, I added that chapter quite later. But everybody else, I sat down with them. And Alma, to see the looks in the eyes of these people as they're retelling the journeys that they've gone through, it's absolutely debilitating. It's absolutely debilitating. Um, and I think also Tando, right? Tando is the, she's, a, she's really at the core of the, the center of that book, right? Mm -hmm. And I was in constant communication with her almost every week, Tando and I were speaking. I think um, seeing seeing Tando, the first time I told her what this book was going to look like, and when she finally read the manuscript when it was done, 
and the way she cried, you know, the way she cried. And, and she was saying to me, like, I'm crying because I think it's such important work, but I'm crying because mm. you've brought back a pain I thought I had forgotten, you know. Mm. I I tried to bury this thing very deep um, because I did not want to think about it anymore. I did not want to remember it anymore. And you have forced me to remember, and it's absolutely very painful. So every time at that stage um, of, of writing the manuscript, there were a lot of tears that were involved, a lot. There were a lot of tears involved on my part, but also on the part of the people whose stories I was trying to tell, you know. Um, my friend Charlene, who also I interviewed, she was from Rhodes, you know, she saw she saw things that no child should ever have to see, right? And mm -hmm. and and for her to retell and to relive those things, it was absolutely very debilitating. And I think for me though, you know, Alma, I the thing that 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 got to me more than the stories themselves, right? was the realization that there are so many more stories like that. I got mm. about 20 or so people that I interviewed and so on, but there are so many more people who are like that. And mm. and the knowledge that the knowledge that these people are at this point locked in their residences in universities and they're not getting any help and they're seeking mm. help and they're being told that you need to wait six more weeks. The list is very long. There isn't enough psychologists in the university and so on. The knowledge that as I'm writing this book, it is a very strong possibility that there's a student at a university right now who is contemplating suicide. That for mm. me was, yeah, it was a lot to deal with, you know, it was a lot to deal with and it's, it's, it still is for me right now, right? It still is right now. Um, I get a lot of emails from young people on a daily basis and some of these emails are, yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot. It's a lot, the kind of things that, that young black people are going through. So for me, there was never a pro, a pro, any part of the book that was easy. The writing itself, the thinking through of the book, even, you know, as the book we have concluded, we have put it in the, on, in the shelves. Um, it's still very difficult for me to see the responses to it, but to also know that one has tried to open up a discussion, but there's just so much more that hasn't been spoken about and that hasn't been acknowledged. Hmm. I wanted to spend some time just to read some of the comments because I think people are really invested in this process. Um, so Sean on YouTube says, it's also frustrating that mental health problems are only seen to be applicable to white people. My friends are very progressive, but I was looked down on for going to therapy. And then Tutlejo also on Facebook says, I love that there's an awakened consciousness for the need to rest. We must we must rest as revolution. Oh, that's powerful. That's powerful. That's absolutely and, powerful. Yo. Uh, Koto from Facebook says, we're taught to be selfless more than we're taught to be self to self-persevere. I have now included self-care Sundays in my weekly routine. It's essential to tap in and speak with our mental health without feeling mm -hmm. selfish. Yeah. And then Sean on Facebook, uh, from YouTube says, as black people in post-apartheid South Africa, can our wounds ever heal? Can we ever heal? We're breaking, making problems in cycles. And Landa said to an earlier conversation, nailed it, language, language, and perceived invalidation. And I think also, Malaika, what is really important, and I think that what your book has brought to consciousness is really like a really deep conversation about racism, right? And about the psychological effect of racism because we think often of the the actual hurtful feelings of racism we say ah it's hurtful in this sense but racism is also like fundamentally hurtful in 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 a sense that it deals with our psyche so how many more people have not been able to navigate into the uh, i love a resourceful queen <laughs> how many more people have uh, <laughs> how many more people have 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 had to die. I think also the conversation about Professor Mayosi, which you bring into the conversation, right? About the whole idea of, it is not only young people who are struggling at these universities. It is also academics, people who have navigated the spaces for a long time. So these institutions are not really helpful for any of us, whether we are a student, whether you are a worker, whether you are an, a, a professor, like this, mental health impacts all of us, right? And we think like a medical doctor would be able to have some form of, you know, yeah. navigation. But even in those instances, we've seen that more often than not, they are also the people who will succumb to suicide, right? And who will make a decision because like it is really deeply pervasive. Yeah. But I also really, really enjoyed the inclusion of the Twani University of Technology, right? Mm -hmm. Because I think it brought a broader conversation. We've lost Malaika for a bit, so we'll just give them a moment to come back in. 
But please, um, if you have any more comments, please uh, reach out and, and comment from wherever you're watching. Thank you for joining us. And if you also want to get a copy, The Cheeky Merchant is your uh, provider. Yeah. You, uh, you can visit uh, www.cheekynatives.co.za slash shop. Or you can go onto our, our Facebook and our um, Twitter and you'll see a link of where to get this. And you will get a copy of Corridors of Death but not only a copy, you will get a signed copy. Come on, somebody. Of come on now. Like come on now. But you know, as chickenators, we think that signed copies are should be in everyone's library. So what we will try to do is always bring you books that have signed copies. Tabi, so um, on uh, Twitter says gorgeous cover. I agree. I think that this this cover is gorgeous. And I think like it's symbolic of like, you know, the grass isn't always greener on the other side. Because that's effectively, I mean, I'm a, and I speak a lot about this, right? The idea of like, you think education will be the saving grace. But this book shows you that often education is not the saving grace. Education is where uh, people come to pass away. Here's Malaika. I'm just going to add her back. Hey, Malaika. Hello. Welcome back. I think you're on mute. Oh, sorry. I'm very sorry, guys. My phone was overheating. So I had to switch on the aircon in the car. I'm very sorry. That's okay. <laughs> So, no. so um, I, I, I did not hear the, 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 the complete question about the issue of so, duty, but yes, let me... I, I will, I will uh, repeat it just for, um, for completion's sake. Yes. I wanted to say that I really enjoyed the inclusion of, of, of the Twani um, University of Technology. And the reason I enjoyed the Twani University of Technology is this, is that often we think that these problems, right, these problems are only in Lily White Institution. But mm -hmm. you, you touched on a very important point, right? You speak about how anti-black racism also perpetuates in institutions that are predominantly black and how yes. even in those institutions it is harder than in white institutions because yes. in white institution at least we have the privilege of the name right that when yes. i enter into a corporate society i enter as a little honola, a graduate from the university of stalinbosch and already mm -hmm. the name carries some particular yes. thing right yes. alma enters from the university of Witt, you enter from the university of mm -hmm. Rhodes. But mm -hmm. what happens when I say I come from a uh, Twani University of Technology, yeah. where the brand of Twani University of Technology was this animalistic understanding in the Fees yeah. Must Fall regime. So anyone yeah. who comes from Twani is branded like that. What happens to you? And what sort of mental ripple effect does that have? So I wanted to know, why was it important for you to bring that into the conversation? Because, you know, as you say, the subtitle, historically white institution. Why was it important for you to shine light on the technology? So for me, for me, there was a number of reasons why TUT had to be spoken about, right? Firstly, TUT had to be spoken about in the context of um, emphasizing the fact that the assault that historically white universities do on, 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 on black people extend even to visibilization, right? I wanted to make an argument that whiteness and racism, right, which births mental pathologies in black people, also survives on making us completely invisible, right? And making our contributions, intellectual contributions and all in contributions in the ideational space, it makes them completely invisible, right? So TUT has to be used as symbolic of the ways in which blackness is rendered invisible, right? To say mm -hmm. that, for example, TUT has been waging the struggle for fees to fall, the struggle against institutional um, violence in its very different manifestation, the struggles against the outsourcing of workers has been waging this, this even before it became, um, it was merged, right? Before the mergers of the Technicon, um, the not, not, uh, Technicon and so on, before it became a merger as an institution, these struggles were already ongoing. But if you read literature today, around the struggle for fees must fall. It, it, does not, it does not center historically black universities in the discourse. It wants to claim fees must fall as a struggle of historically white universities. So I had to speak about TUT to say this kind of violence continues even in the way that knowledge is produced, packaged and distributed, right? And therefore how knowledge is consumed, that we are going to grow up in a generation of black people who are going to grow up thinking that historically white universities had the moral sense to, to, to fight for free education, when in fact this comes from the intellectual and the activist labor, right, 
of black students in historically black universities. And here we are again, invisibilizing them. But it also mm. had to come in for a second reason. And that reason is that I wanted to demonstrate, right, that the mental health pathologies that exist amongst black people are deeply mm. institutionalized, right, and deeply structural as well, and that they are born of a society that is embedded in a mode of production that reproduces inequality, right? That it's not possible for us to imagine a South Africa where black people can thrive as human beings in a society where you have got a tiny university of technology that is held on the margins of existence. That when you hurl institutions at the margin of existence that are supposed to cater for black students, then you are effectively recreating and reproducing the spatial injustices and inequalities that then create spatial environments that birth mental health, mental pathologies. So I, I did a lot of interviews with students at Sunny University of Technology, and I read up on a lot of literature and, 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 and a lot of the, you know, the policies that have been going on in that institution. And for example, I give examples about the documentaries that were done by the Mail and Guardian that speak mm. about students at the university who couldn't even go to university because there was so much crime in the township in Sochanguve where they were located, right? Mm. So I'm trying to say basically that you create... A, a society in which black people are held into townships that are a reserve ca camp of labor, which are basically effectively concentration camps, right? Unemployment thrives there, poverty thrives there, inequalities thrive there, and as a result, it, all kinds of mental health pathologies will thrive there because there mm -hmm. is a link between the lack of structural neglect and structural violence and mental health pathologies. These mm -hmm. young boys who are smoking Nyaobe in Soshangube and terrorizing the students at TUT themselves are products of a system that creates black people who are animalized, right? And who, mm -hmm. as a result, suffer from all kinds of mental health pathologies that they then need to, they then need to, to numb using all of these substances, right? These young mm. people who are smoking drugs, who are smoking yoga and all of that, have been failed by the system. They are failed by the system. These are not people who chose to make reckless decisions about their lives. These are poor black people who had no options. These are poor black people who did not have the resources to go into universities, who come from very broken families, who is, and the brokenness is historical, can be traced back to our colonial past, the migrant labor system, the single parents who are raising us, the unemployed parents who are raising us, and so on and so forth. So I wanted to give an indication of what the township reality looks like, right? And mm -hmm. therefore, how it is linked to violence and how that violence then permeates into all other um, agencies of socialization and institutions in society. I'm very deliberate to say that the university is a microcosm of society. So all of these problems that we face, you know, at TUT, the kids can't go to school because there's, you know, they're scared that if they leave, they come back, they don't find their stuff there because they would have been stolen and so on. I'm saying to, to in this book that that is violence. But that is a violence that is so systematically embedded that people don't even recognize that it's violence. People don't realize that we're talking about violence when a student can't go to school because they're afraid that if they leave, they will be marked on the streets, right? But if that student does not go to class because they're afraid they'll be marked, then they don't go to class then they drop out, then the throughput rates of this university are very low. And then, you know, there's a lot of dysfunction that then emerges out of that. And then these, these students who then don't graduate and so on become part of the unemployed masses in our country. And then they, they stay in their homes, very depressed, can't make ends meet and so on. What kind of young people, what kind of children do they then raise, right? They raise children in that environment too. And so the cycle continues and continues. So I, I'm saying there's a link between the mental health pathologies that black people then suffer with later on in life and the systems and structures and the environment in which we are raised in. And it's important that we talk about that. And I'm a geographer, mm -hmm. you know, so I'm a geographer, but that's my qualification, I'm a geographer. So, so, and I think that's also one of the things that people are saying, Malaika, but you are as an expert in geography. Why are you talking about mental health? And I was saying mm -hmm. it's because black lives are spatial matters. Black yes. matters are spatial matters. Yes. You can't speak yes. about blackness without speaking about spatial issues. You can't speak about, you can't talk about, you know, landlessness without understanding the deeply yes. embedded socioeconomic, psychological, and even just general problems that it creates for black people to be thrust in townships, to be landless, to be pariahs in our own land. Those are very important issues. Yeah. I think you also explored something that was so interesting and you've spoken about it, is how people can hold multiple identities, right? There's an intersection that you looked at as well. And so I was particularly taken aback, I think, by the story of the black woman who was a master's student and the ways in which 
And I mean, it's coming to the fore because Le Chocanolo will speak about the ways in which racism harms us, you know, so we, we think of, yes, I was hurt by the racist things, but there's mm-hmm. ways in which racism impedes your career progression, but also holds you back and, and almost instills this self-doubting that you carry even in other parts of your of your career as well you know so i think of the master's student who was not being adequately supervised by her yes. by her supervisor you know and, and yes. i think of of that as such a, a beautiful description of the ways in which even these mm-hmm. spaces that i mean academia loves to pants itself as being this place that yes. is progressive yes. that is you know mm-hmm. advanced that is free from a lot of the social ills but here Again, you see the ways in which racism continuously impedes black women, particularly in those spaces. Mm-hmm. And I'm really interested in that and what some of the reactions to that part have been. So, so one of the things that you're very correct, right, about how racism impedes even on our our capacity to progress and to thrive anyway, right? Um, and the issue of supervision. Now, that one is a um, it's very heartbreaking. It's very personal to me as well. You know, this issue of supervision is very personal to me um, because um, I know the experience of having white supervisors who really are just not present, who really just are not present, right? But 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 for me, that is not the issue. The issue really is that you know, Kagazile's story was 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 brought to my attention much later. That's that's the girl I was telling you about that we didn't get to meet face to face because the story was brought to me much later. The issue of Kagazile was. Yeah, it was it was it was debilitating for me, and it came about um, because I was speaking to another friend of mine who had decided that she had had enough. She's leaving Rhodes University. She can't do it anymore. She's not being supervised properly. In fact, her supervisor had demeaned her so much at that point, um, mm-hmm. insulted her. You know, he uh, insulted mm-hmm. her intellectual depth that has also you know, and it had a lot of racial undertones in it. Ne? That she mm-hmm. she couldn't take it anymore. And this was a very normally a very quiet young person, very you know a very really a very, very, the kind of person that you don't, isn't, not a problem maker. You know, some of us, we've always been problem makers, even at university, we raise these issues. She really wasn't that person. You know, she she really, I'm going to call it T. Her name begins with T. I'm not going to say her name in full. But T was those really quiet students in class, very, you know, a very studious learner and so on and so forth. So when she then, you know, experienced this thing where her supervisor did that to her, she was, I mean, it, she became a completely different person. She became a completely different person. Um, and, and that is how she actually introduced me then to Kagazile Makubo. But then, then I then put a post on my Facebook to say, guys, what has been your experience with your supervisors, right? You know, let's talk about this thing of, of supervisors and white supervisors in particular. Oh, man. Oh, man. The most. Yo, it blew up. Look, it was, it was, it was something else. That, that, that post, it went viral, but the mm. stories that were shared on that post, mm. uh-uh. I don't know how, you know, I, I I, don't know how we do it as black people. I don't. I don't know how black people, I don't know how we, we live like this. Speak on I it. Don't know, Speak on I it. don't know how we live like this. I, I don't know how we are able to wake up every day and to teach the world humanity, because we do it every day, by the way. We teach black, we teach the world humanity every day. And I don't know how we do it. it. I don't know how we do it. it. Because the the things that black students were sharing on that post that they have gone through in the hands of racist white supervisors are not things that are humanly possible to comprehend. So our levels of endurance clearly are being tested all the time. And I don't know how we do it. Because Alma, I, I'm going to actually tag you on that post later on tonight. But I want you to read those comments. The things that people were saying. One one person whose story I even shared in the book, right? The supervisor allowed them at master's level, allows this person to do the research, do the data, does everything and all of that. Just shortly before the person is supposed to, to submit their final dissertation, the supervisor says, This is nonsense. In those words. And she shared the she took a screen grab of the of the of the email and shared it with with, with us on my wall. And the supervisor says, this is nonsense, and this nonsense can be published. This is nonsense. You, you must start from the beginning. But where were you the whole time? Where were you the whole time? And, and interestingly, interestingly, despite the fact that I've got over 100 and, over 140,000 uh, 140, people on my Facebook, followers, and so on and so forth, all of the comments that came there came from black people. Not a single white person came there and said, I had a terrible experience with my supervisor. They did this to me and so on and so forth. Not a single person. 
in over 700 comments was a white person with an experience of a white supervisor who was not there for them. It was instead black people in historically white universities who came there talking about white supervisors doing this to them. So for me, that in its own also says something. But but remember also, now, now Sijako, who then shared that thing about being told as well, her dissertation was nonsense and so on. Imagine the damage that that does to you and to your mm. self-esteem as a person, to your intellectual esteem as a person. I don't think she's going to do a PhD. I don't, right? Because how do you do a PhD when at master's level, a white supervisor told you that you've just produced nonsense. The damage that that does to you psychologically, right, makes it impossible. So the impediments to your, to your, to your growth as a black person mm. are not only structural. It's not just because you don't have funding or because there's racism. In, no, it's also that a white lecturer will have made you think that as a person, you don't have the capacity to excel, that your, your, your being a master's student was a product of affirmative action, was a product mm. of chance, and not yeah. a product of you being in intellectually capable. And so we don't even see black young black people having the confidence in themselves to pursue um, education to its, you know, to, its, to its zenith, there to the level of PhD, because you have been battered so much at these institutions from undergraduate all the way to master's, that you actually don't even believe you can do it all the way to PhD, because you don't think you are worthy. Mm. Malaika, I want to say that, like, I hold a very painful memory of a law firm that I used to work at when I, you know, when I was younger. This white woman said to me, do they not teach you how to write letters, right? And mm -hmm. that has built, like, a really complex relationship with me and writing, right? And mm -hmm. what I'm writing and what I'm producing. Because at the back of my mind, there is this do you even know how to string words together to write a letter? Mm -hmm. And I can tell you the mental anguish that that has caused for me in the many things that I do, right? So every mm -hmm. time I need to think about like, is this word the right word that I'm supposed to be using in this context, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, people would like to say, but Le Tokonolo, you've achieved so much. But like, there's this constant thing that I constantly talk about, that I have this huge complex with writing, right? Mm -hmm. Because someone who is white, drilled it into me that because you're black, you're not able to do particular things, right? And yeah. these things are things that we hold. So you think about this master's student who, let's for a moment think that they may not do a PhD. Let's say mm -hmm. that they go corporate. What sort of anguish do they have, right? The first mm -hmm. time they draft an email from a supervisor and the supervisor says, no, I don't like it this way. Automatically what they will hear is what that other white person said. Yeah. This is yeah. nonsense. Right. So we don't even think about the impact of the power of words that have on our ability to live. And I also really like something that you said about teaching about humanity. You know, something happens to me often these days where like some white person will ask for help and I will assist them. And I will think later on about like, wow. Right. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. we are so human that in those moments when people need yeah. assistance, you yeah. are really out to someone else's humanity. Yeah right? Yes. But they can turn around in a moment to tell you, oh my gosh, you guys this, you guys that, you guys this, you guys that, mm -hmm. black people this, black people that, right? Mm -hmm. And how like, even in those moments, you cannot fight because you know, yes. you are going to respect people, these mm -hmm. are elders, or this is whatever. And how like, mm. when do we get to just breathe and be, right? Like, and just be who we are. When do we get that moment? I have to tell you that I buried the bigger person. So I think mm -hmm. that the person is a is a lie. It's a myth. It's a thing that particularly black women are all. It's a lie. It's like a thing that black women are always told to be in order for us not to hold people accountable for their actions. So yeah. someone will be will commit a microaggression and you must be the bigger person because even you're, you're not even allowed the humanity of anger, right? You're not mm -hmm. even allowed the humanity of dissatisfaction, of anger, of hurts. And now you must be the bigger person. So I have now buried the bigger person. The bigger person died. Um, and now I know, and now this is self-preservation and this is a radical act. So I am no longer the bigger person. And if you behave in ways that are dismissive of my humanity or that are abusive to me, then I stop the journey right there. But this, this idea that we're always going to be performing for our humanity is some of the reasons why we can't rest. You can't rest because you must always be excellent. You must mm. always be 
people. You must always be kind. You must always extend empathy and humanity to people who have had centuries to recognize that in you and have continuously failed to. So me personally, in 2020, oh. I buried the person died. I buried her. Let me tell you, you see, I, I, I get I get to in that to that state every year. Every like every year of my life I've gone through that. Um where I'm like, I'm tired. Like I actually for me it even gets to a point where and even in the book I make the argument that I am no longer going to talk to white people about racism. I'm done talking to white people about racism, right? When I write now, I'm very deliberate that I'm writing for black people. And even the book, when you open the book, it says in the beginning, this book is written for black students in historically white universities, blah, 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 and so on and so forth. Because I've become very deliberate in saying that my role as a writer and as an activist, right, as a as a geographer and as a person who's invested in the ideational space, my job for which I commit myself to, right, is to be kind and gentle to black people is to make black people visible and to be seen right is to give a voice to black people all over the space right and as far as i can and as widely as i can right but to not arrogate myself the right to believe i'm the spokesperson however to make to to humanize the experiences that define us right what i'm no longer invested in doing um is to try and have these conversations with white i'm, I'm not invested anymore because it's emotionally hemorrhaging it is absolutely emotionally bruising that we constantly have to explain what racism is and what it does to us right so now i'm saying to black people maybe let's take a break of trying to explain this to everybody else what it is can we just amongst ourselves sit and breathe and cry and have a space where we are crying and we are saying this is hurtful this is too much this has dealt with me i'm tired i can't do this i can't finish this degree what is there what is support is there for me um, as a young black person, how do I how do I breathe as a young person better, right? I don't want this book to be a book about saying this is what white people need to do to recognize. I don't want to do that. I'm not I'm no longer invested in writing about what white people need to do to recognize our humanity. I'm invested now in saying that look, um, we have bled as black people. We have been bleeding. We have bled. We come from many places of brokenness, right? How do we find it amongst ourselves and each other to heal mm -hmm. ourselves? in order that we may regain the strength to fight more for the changing of a society that is going to see us as truly human. But I'm like you, Alma. I'm not, I'm not, um, I'm no longer trying to be a bigger person to anybody. I'm no longer trying to be nice to anybody. I'm now trying to say it's time that black people to self-preserve, right? I'm saying to black people, allow yourself to self-preserve because you've done nothing else for the entire existence of your being than to be a person who's trying to make sense to everybody else. You've tried so hard to, to exist, to survive. And I'm saying that this survivalism that we are living through, this survivalist mode that we are living in, it is not sustainable. And we see it because young black people now, more than ever, are saying that we, you know, I always say when somebody dies by suicide, right? Um, they are not dying because, and I, I said in the book, they don't, they're not killing themselves and all of that. And we need to change that language. People don't kill themselves, right? Mm -hmm. Depression kills people, right? People that commit suicide or that, that die by suicide are often people who are suffering with serious mental health issues. And I want to say that in these, in these historically white universities, young black people are not mm -hmm. killing themselves. These institutions are killing young black people. Young mm. black people are not killing themselves in our townships. The conditions of native in the townships are killing young black people. So mm. if we move this thing of saying, because once we say, no, they're killing themselves, then we are removing the responsibility of recognizing what it is that is what it is that is actually killing these young people, right? When we say, oh, these people, we are, we are, we are moving the responsibility away from the institutions and the systems that are responsible for creating that reality for young black people. And we must start mm -hmm. calling things, we must start putting the responsibility of everything where it belongs, right? And the responsibility of and, 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 and the responsibility of the mental health of young black people is a systematic and an institutional issue. We need to stop saying that young black people are killing themselves and all of that. They are dying because they are living through very difficult societies in very difficult institutions where they're not being heard, not being seen, not being recognized, and therefore their humanity constantly being invalidated and they're constantly being decivilized, right? Because racism is also decivilizing. And I, and I, I use this word and people, I've, at one time somebody was asking me, what do you mean it's decivilizing? And I say, racism 
takes away your capacity to be a civil human being. And that is exactly what it does. It's it's on University of Technology, right? That these students for so long have been screaming at the tops of their voices and no one wanted to hear them. They were not they were not palatable in the eyes of a white normative media and a white normative society, right? And so what did it do? They they were turned into these people that we then said, oh, give you hooligans and all of that. But they were turned that way because their civilization, their capacity to be civil was taken away from them by a system that does not recognize the humanity of black students in these universities. So racism not only dehumanizes, it decivilizes you. It makes of you truly an animal. And that's where I want us to, you know, to, to engage, to say that these things that we take for granted and we think, oh, no, so and so on and so forth. Let's have a conversation about how those things are deliberately, systematically architected and constructed. And once we see them in that way, we're going to see black people very differently. Mm, I wanted to share some comments of people um, listening to us over the interwebs. So um, Michelle says, I know how deep this subject is, but it looks like that we need in our classrooms starting from high school and not universities, because that is where the struggles begin to surface as well. And they are exasperated in these institutions. And then on YouTube says, preach Malaika, you are a prophet of our time. Thank you for the gift of your voice. Another comment is um, people talking to my sharing about uh, my experience. Ole mm -hmm. I feel you, I avoid writing publicly because of the comments I've received from my white teachers back in high school. And someone says, gosh, I had the same experience in high school. I ran from, uh, I ran away from anything that would make me write anything longer than two sentences. And Tabi, so on um, mm. Twitter says, we can't rest, you know. And Tutlaho uh, says, um, Bell Hooks speaks of education as liberating agent that requires the educated to honor the spirit of the learner. The violence perpetuated by these white lecturers shows that they are not teachers. Oh, mm. and that's profound. That's very profound. profound. Very profound. Uh, there's Itu Meleng says, if you need someone to be on their knees in order for you to feel tall, then something is wrong with you. You with you. And white people have a serious problem and they should figure out what they are going to do about it. Tony Morrison. Mm. Mm. I have very a profound. question. Like, so I want to know at the at the so we you've written this book, you know, we've spoken about mm. the struggle. Mm. What what is next, you know? So not necessarily what's just next for the book, but what is next? So we have this conversation, but really, I guess what what does a a future that we imagine where there are no struggles for Black students to exist in this in the in these institutions? What does that look like? So what is so for me? For me, for me, for me, the overhaul that's needed, and I say it in the book, right, is systematic. But you don't, you don't, you don't dismantle uh, systems and structures overnight, right? You build building blocks. You create building blocks for these things, right? Um, we're not going to wake up tomorrow in a socialist society. It's not going to happen. It's not going. That is the ideal. If if you say, you know, po um, Professor Pumla Gola always speaks about the need for us to do dream work, to imagine the world that we want to live in, to imagine it anew. What does it look like, and so on? And she calls it the dream work, right? But the thing is. We, we are not even going to be able to do, um, to do, we can do the dream work, of course, but we're not going to change the world overnight tomorrow. But what is it that we can do today, right now, right? Um, what is it that I want this book to do right now? So one of the things that I wanted to do, like I said, I wanted to be a healing space for other young black people to say, this is where I see myself. I find myself in this book and my feelings are valid. I'm valid. I'm seen. And I'm, 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 a, I'm a full human being, right? With all my vulnerabilities and all of these things. But the second thing that I wanted to do, I wanted to be a call to action for young people, particularly activists in universities, right? We need to put pressure on these institutions to create um, systems and to put in place support structures that are going to be very deliberate and very specific to dealing with issues of mental health. I'm going to be in a panel discussion next week with um, the Deputy Minister at the University of Pretoria. We're going to be having the, um, this, this discussion about what is it really then that needs to happen. And I'm going to make an argument that, I've, that I made in the book and that I'm going to make to him and that I'll be making everywhere where I'm invited to speak, that the government of South Africa needs to invest very meaningfully and very deliberately in very, very key institutions that are going to help young black people. So we need to be seeing we need to see government in the same way that it's able to create, to, to find money to create all other kinds of things, create mm -hmm. 
therapy, um, what is it, you know, counseling spaces in the townships, right? Mm-hmm. Have spaces like that. Have a space in the township where a young person can go into without money and without a medical aid and they get help for anxiety and depression or whatever else that they may be dealing with, right? Create the same platforms, not just in universities, but in the townships as well, right? We need to see government take mental health very seriously. And part of what that it, it needs to do, therefore, is to invest the human resource, the infrastructural resource, and the financial resource, really, into creating, um, into building spaces where young Black people can go to when they need help. It's like it was, they, you know, mental health issues are also very, you know, psychology is a science. There's a reason why this thing is a science. It's not a, it's not anybody, not anybody is a psychologist. That's why I always say to people, I may be your friend, but you, you can't come to me with some problems. And even if you come to me, I can't help you because you, you, I can, I can listen to you. But these things require professionals to help you with these things. You need mm-hmm. professional help for these kinds of things. That's why people go through so many years of study in order for them to then come out and be psychologists and all that because they understand the human mind and the human emotions in a particular way. So government needs to start saying, recognizing mental health as more than just a thing that can be resolved when people talk to their friends or their families and so on, but as something that needs specific, dedicated, systematic assistance and attention, and to then start putting in place the necessary infrastructure and resources for young people to go to. I think before we end the conversation, it's important for us just to give people a little taste of like what the book is about. And because, you know, we are kind, we are going to, I, I want to read from the last the last page of the book, because I think for me, like when I read this page, I was like, yes. So you write mm-hmm. here, Ultimately, the most important thing that can be done to help the multitudes of students, particularly working class black students, is to fashion a society in which they do not have to carry the heavy burdens that they are born carrying. To do this demands what Professor Pumla refers to as dream work, the difficult work of reimagining a country anew and reimagining ourselves into existence. It demands unwavering commitment on the part of the state, the private sector, and all key and all key agencies of socialization to address the deeply embedded structural challenges that are rendering so many black people disenfranchised and debilitated. Poverty is humiliating. It is dehumanizing and decivilizing. If we cannot meaningfully alleviate that, then we can't start the long journey towards healing our broken nation. But as Japan, South Korea and Hong Kong demonstrate, it takes more than economic development to heal to deal with the challenges of mental health. For this reason, our work in the alleviation of poverty must also factor in other aspects of what makes us human and what gives us meaning to our collective existence. The question of justice arises. We cannot hope to deal with, to heal South Africa unless we seek and attain justice for the many injustices that have been meted out against black people over the many centuries of oppression, colonization, apartheid and neoliberal regime that has facilitated the continued dehumanization of black people. Justice is a fundamental ingredient to healing. We must seek justice not only for the suffering that black people have historically endured, but for the more contemporary suffering in such moments as the feast must fall moment. I cannot overemphasize the importance of our government and the higher learning institution taking responsibility for the psychological trauma that students were put through over the past few years. Feast must fall cost lives particularly black lives. Not only did it literally cost the lives of other students, such as Benjamin Pertle at the university, at Twani University of Technology, and my friend who died by suicide years after leading the movement at Roads Must Fall, but it also cost the mental health of multitudes of students. Some left to universities, never to return. Others continue to struggle to stay sane. Young people lost so many in so many ways, and we're going on as though nothing happened. Something happened, something tragic happened. And until we seek justice for it and many other injustices, we are going to continue to bury young black people. And these universities are going to continue to be our resting place where daily we die. Those were your words, right? And like just reading them again now, I'm like... (laughs) Yeah. I need yeah, a moment. I, right? I need a moment, and I and I, I, I suppose as a as a parting shot before we, if you have any questions, please pop questions onto the comment box so we can post to Malaika before we end our conversation, which has been truly glorious. Mm. You write about your friend, mm-hmm. 
right? And you write about someone who was close to you and someone who you 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 write about uh, about something that I, I I'm often really challenged by, right? The mm-hmm. idea of had I been there for this person in this particular way, mm-hmm. would this have not happened? Would this have happened, right? And I want to ask you this question, right? I think a lot about the the the, the idea that if I decide to commit to die by suicide. I don't believe in, in, in truth that any of the people in my life, no matter how close they are to me, would be able to change my mind. Because as you say, right, depression, anxiety, and mental health is not a fly, 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 I'm just feeling it. It's really mm-hmm. something that really impedes. Yeah. And sometimes the feeling of not wanting to feel this way is so overwhelming. And I believe mm-hmm. in my deeper sense that rest is important. So I have a two-prong question. How challenging was it for you to accept in many ways that perhaps there was nothing that you could have done as your as a friend in this situation that would have you know kept your friend alive? But two, Malaika, these are very hectic, hectic topics that you speak about. How do you, as Malaika, take care of yourself? How do you make sure that you don't burn out and that these things don't impact you in and, and cause psychological trauma? Mm. So I I don't think um I don't think I'm ever going to get to a place where I don't feel um where the death of my friend um is not going to be very personal to me right um and i know you 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 make a a valid argument that um when someone wants to go there's nothing much that you can do but it's very it's very hard to it's very hard when someone that you know dies like that it's mm. It's very hard when when someone that you you, you know um, dies like that, and let's just give me like a moment. I'm sorry. Um, Don't be sorry. Don't be sorry. It's really, uh, it's really very hard when it's hard not to take it personal when someone who gave so much of herself to us, right? She, she fought very hard during Feast Must Fall. She, she gave everything to that movement. She gave everything to that movement. Everything she had, she gave to that movement. And and she was fighting so that other people, other young black people don't ever go through the things that she and some of us have gone through. And for her to go out like that is it's always going to be very hard for me. I'm I'm mm. never going to... I'm never going to get to a place where it's easy, right? I'm never going to get to a place where I think about her and it's not very painful. Because for me, the biggest um the biggest symbol of our failure as mm. as black people that she fought so hard for mm. is that in the end we failed her. And I feel that way. I strongly feel that way. And I feel that way because I think it's the system that failed her, you know? I mm. think the system failed her. I think I think being black failed her, right? Mm. I think being black failed her. And I think I think I think it's not fair and it's not right that that she died like that. Mm. I don't think it's it's fair that it was so lonely for her in the end, you know? Mm. Um because yeah, like because she gave so much, and I I don't know that I'll ever get over that particular death. You know, I 
I've lost a lot, you know, I've lost, I've lost my mom and all of that, but you can make sense of those other deaths. You know, you can say my mom died of cancer, she was sick and all of that. You can make sense of those other deaths. But that young woman's death is one death that, that I'll never ever get over. You know, it, it's never going to happen for me because every time I, I, I think of students at universities who are there and they've got free education and all of that, and I always say to myself, oh, but the cost of this, you know, the cost was her life. She died for mm -hmm. the struggle. It killed her in the end, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's why this book has to be written, right? Because I don't want to bury any other friend. I don't want to bury my friends ever again. I don't want any other young black person to die like this. I don't want the system to continue to kill young people like this, right? And I don't want universities to be complacent in this and to say that there's nothing that they can do because there has to be something that they can do. Because if I, if, if, if spaces of learning are not going to, to be liberating, then what is their purpose? Why do they exist? If they're not going to be spaces of liberation, not only in terms of the intellectual content they give us, but also in terms of the kinds of human beings that they produce out of us. If they don't become spaces of healing and spaces of revolution and science of struggle in the true sense of the word what then is their purpose why are we going into these spaces after all right so for me this book is also for her right it's also for her because because the system that that produces the mental health pathologies in black people produce yeah. them in her and in the end they killed her you know mm -hmm. and that's why i'm saying that um universities are going to continue to kill us if nothing is done. And as for me and how I deal with my own, I, I've i been fortunate to have um, a very good support structure and a support system. And, and like I say in the book, the most painful irony is that she was one of that support structure for me, right? Mm -hmm. um, she was my support structure um, when, when I was at my absolute lowest after losing my mom. She was my support structure. I've got people, Dr. Professor Nomalangam Kize. I've got people like um, I've like Baba Lama Kotwana. I've got people like Professor Uleng Lengkabul. I've got a strong support network of strong, not of strong, of black women. A strong support network of black women who carry me when I'm at my weakest. And I'm often at my weakest, actually. And they carry me. And I, I, it's one of the things that I've learned is very important in the space as we live and negotiate is that it is so important that we lean on each other because there's going to be so many moments when we don't have our strength and we're going to need to borrow each other's strengths. And we need, I need to be able to know that when I'm at my weakest, Babalo is going to borrow me her strength. Nomalanga is going to borrow me her strength. Alma is going to borrow me her strength. You know, um, mm -hmm. it's very important. I think the only way that young black people also get through life, get through this very violent and debilitating existence is to lean on each other and to always mm -hmm. be, the anchors for each other, to give solidarity for each other in whatever way that we can, you know. Um, solidarity looks different and it looks in very many ways. Um, sometimes solidarity is simply no malanga, like she did a few days ago. She said to me, hey, look, I know things are difficult in Johannesburg. If you need to breathe, come to the beach and breathe fresh air. Come to PE, my house is open. That is solidarity. And that is, you know, um, Tepo Madlingozi, um, Dr. Tepo Madlingozi, who's now at VETS, um, he says, Malaika, I know that you are doing your master's and I know that the you know, thing is very difficult and so on. If you need to talk or you need anything, just a call or anything like that. And these are people that I've, I've not met him with my own eyes. I've not seen him personally. But all of those kinds of acts of solidarity that exist in many spaces, we must try treasure them and we must not, you know, we must nourish them because very often they become the difference between whether we go on or we don't. And for me, they've been, they've been my source of motivation. They've been my source of inspiration. Just last night, I spent my night with, at the house of um, Professor Puleng Lengkabula, you know, um, and um, she, you know, there are those people that when things are very hard, I go to them and I say, look, it's hard, man. I And sometimes all I want is to just sleep in your bed and for you to just let me sleep in your house or, you know, that's it. That's all I want. And they do that. And I think that's what black people, we need to do that. We need to, to create that for each other, right? We need to create spaces for each other to find healing when things get difficult. We need to find, we need to find people that say to us, it's okay for you to not be okay and to not be strong. And for me, this book, ultimately what I wanted to do, Alma and Tessa Honora and everybody who's watching, I want this book to galvanize Black people, to create for other Black people a safe net for lending. 
we must be a safe net for lending for each other. Because if we don't do it, mm. we're going to die, all of us. We're going to die. Mm. Thank you so much, Nanaka. We thank you so much just for your, for your vulnerability. Thank you so much for your tenderness. We really do appreciate the, the time that you've given us. We appreciate the work that you've done. This is such a beautiful uh, piece of writing. And I think in, in so many ways, it's going to spark the kind of conversation that we really need to have. And I think that just from the Cheeky Natives, we really do want to give you your flowers for the ways in which you've made sure that young Black people's stories and their experiences are seen in ways that I don't think anyone but a Black woman could have done and so I just want to really take this moment to just give you your flowers from the Cheeky Natives and to honor you for the amazing work that you've done in, in Cradles of Death but the amazing work that you continue to do even outside of, of, this book, of this book and I hope that you'll be galvanized by seeing tonight how many people feel seen by your work, how many people feel answered, how many people feel that so many of their questions have been raised and have been seen in this book and so I just want to take this moment to really appreciate the work that you've done not only here but outside of, of this as well and also just to remind everybody that if you also want a copy of this book if you name doing right then please make sure that you get a copy of corridors of death from the cheeky merchants we will have a we have copies of this book and we're so excited please buy buy books don't ask for pdfs but please don't ask for pdfs don't ask the author for a copy, please buy the book. Uh, and we're so excited to see what this book is going to do. Uh, and I think also, Malika, just to say again, just to echo Alma's sentiments, right? Thank you also for feeling safe to be vulnerable with us. Um, I think often as the Cheeky Natives, what we try to do is create space for Black people to be able to have these conversations and not feel like there's a particular gaze in which we are pretending to be strong and pretending to be this. So thank you also for allowing us the space to be vulnerable with you. We hope that we've held this space in, in a meaningful way for you and that you feel seen for the work that you do because often we know that this work can be very thankless. And to everyone watching, thank you for sharing space with us in the way that you have. Um, the best way in which you can support writers is to get their books, right? And as Amma says, Corridors of Death is available from the Cheeky Merchant. If you want to support Malaika, support Malaika by buying her book, not only for yourself, but for people in your circle. But more importantly, to continue to, you know, sh have this conversation about what it means to <laughs> exist as Black people in an anti-Black world, right? Uh, in a world that wasn't created for us to flourish in, in any ways. And I just want to say there are a number of people who say thank you. So I just want to give you some of the flowers from the people. Thank you for the beautiful and difficult conversation. Um, oh, Asanda says, Kamaku. So, uh, so thank you, Malaika. Thank you thank so you. much uh, thank you. For, 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 for this. Um, we, we really hope best-selling things are going to happen for the book, but we also yeah. continuously hope that you will always have a safe landing. Thank you very much. I appreciate thank this you. very much. Thank you. Uh, to everyone, thank you very much for joining us for this conversation. Um, thank you for the people who are watching on Facebook. Thank you for the people who are watching on YouTube. And thank you for the people who are watching on Twitter. Please follow us at Chikim Natives, um, either at on Twitter or on Instagram. And subscribe to our YouTube channel on YouTube, The Cheeky Natives, and follow us on Facebook, The Cheeky Natives. And if you have SoundCloud and... Um, all the other platforms, just type in the Cheeky Natives and subscribe to our podcast. And this conversation will be up on YouTube. Um, so if you want to, you know, return to it, to quote Malaika, when you are doing the things, you're welcome to do that. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful evening.